This meeting is being recorded. Okay, Doki, welcome everyone to our fourth workshop. So just over half and the end is fast approaching, unbelievably so. Um, it's been good just having everyone on for the last four workshops and all the topics and questions that we've been able to, to, to go through. Uh, tonight, we are gonna be speaking on music marketing and publicity. I think this is one of the major, major factors in um, you know having a successful project. Uh, we could create great projects over and over, but if there isn't a good push behind them, um, it's hard to reach the audience that we need to and just kind of have that project live out the life that it deserves to. So this is a workshop that get your pen, get your paper, don't be afraid to write down notes, don't be afraid to ask questions. I am your host for this and all the other workshops in the series. Um, my name is Karis, uh, just a little bit about me. So I am a singer, songwriter, music producer. I do quite a bit on the creative side, um, but like I always say, that just sparked my interest for things on the business side. Kind of wanted to see um, what was going on behind the scenes in terms of management and marketing and all of that stuff. So that kind of led me to study music management at Harris Institute. Um, and then going from there, just working with recording studios, setting up workshops um, like this with ReSound, Polaris Music Prize. And now I'm director of operations at Afrowave TO, um, which is an initiative that we started and have been, you know, trying to maintain just to help fill the void um, that we saw in the industry. And that was a lot of the culture, as we call them culturally, derived sounds, so reggaeton and um, soca, reggae, dancehall, uh, we weren't seeing a platform that was big enough for artists that worked in these genres to be able to really express themselves and have access to resources that would help them to reach their full potential. So all of that, you know, gave birth to live showcases. And then when COVID hit, we kind of pivoted to doing some virtual stuff like workshop series that we've been running since 2020. Um, on with me today, we have Coburn Blair and Dalton Higgins. Um, they're going to be dropping numerous gems on music marketing and publicity, um, kind of helping all of us here just figure out this side of the industry and um, just navigating and how we can elevate ourselves. I'm gonna give them a chance to speak, you know, on, on themselves. If you want their full bios, that is up on our Eventbrite um, page for the event. So you can feel free to check that out. Uh, Dalton, why don't we start with you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks, uh, Karis. Uh, thanks for the intro and, and thanks for doing this. I mean, yeah, you know, definitely thanks for having me out. I mean, what I appreciate, I really love what Afrowave TO is doing and, and what you stand for, to be perfectly mm -hmm. honest. And mm -hmm. and I don't say that as um, you know, I've I've worked some, I've I've managed some PR projects for uh for the organization, Afrowave TO. And I I, you know, for me, we rotate in and out clients. Um, you know, like uh we have a laundry list of clients, you know, a lot of we do a lot of celebrity publicity, we work with a lot of uh, you know, music festivals and uh mm -hmm. even now moving into NFTs. Um, but uh, what I what I particularly like about Afrowave TO is um, because you're able to, like, it, it's kind of like this. Someone has to connect the dots as far as uh, you know, sort of I guess black music genres, you know. So, yeah. so people, so you can't talk about hip hop, um, you know, rap music without talking about reggae, okay? Um, because I don't want to get all too geeky on people tuning <laughs> in, but I mean, you know, the the Godfather, you know, the founding father of reggae is a Jamaican DJ, you know, named Cool Herc who came to the South Bronx in the late 60s. You know what I mean? Like there's no yeah. rap music or hip hop without Jamaica or reggae. There's, there's no such thing, it wouldn't exist, right? Yeah. Same thing goes is everybody's on a big, you know, Afro beats wave and I love Afro beats, you know what I mean? Like DeVito, Wizkid, Burna Boy, I've seen, I, mm -hmm. I love Afro beats. Like I'm just all over it, but you can't talk about Afro beats without talking about dance hall. You see what I mean? Okay, so so these music forms that you all are producing, Afrowave Teal, they're all sisters and cousins and brothers and distant relatives. Okay, so keep doing what you're doing. Also, too, here's the other thing. Uh, before I dive into a bit of publicity, um, is 
Afrowave, because Afrowave Tio is representing, you know, as far as uh, dance hall and reggaeton and hip hop and R&B and soul, the whole Afro diasporic black music spectrum, uh, the enjoyment I personally get out of this, um, you know, uh, out of out of doing work with you guys is I, I like seeing when I'm able to get you guys like we, you, you guys did a Sean Paul show. So we did some publicity yeah. around that. So to hear Sean Paul, we got him on. I got him on CBCQ. All right. And CBCQ, it's a it's a show that's listened to by a lot of Canadians. It's you know, it's still our music. It's dance hall music, black yeah. music. But to hear him talk on CBCQ with Tom Power and uh, CBCQ is a show. Again, I'm going to be dropping a lot of gems, but CBCQ is a show that when you get on there, like Afrowave T, Afrowave TO was able to, Sean Paul did a spot. It's picked up um, in 100 plus U.S. markets. OK, so sometimes artists in Toronto, they'll be like, OK, I don't listen to CBC or maybe I don't want to do this. But the show is picked up in over 100 U.S. markets, OK, mm -hmm. through NPR. You understand? So that's why you do CBCQ, uh, CBCQ, right? So if you're an independent artist, if you're a dancehall artist, Afrobeats from downtown Toronto, don't come and tell me that you don't want to do CBCQ, OK? If, I, if I'm able to get you a booking on there, because you're going to get heard in 100 US markets in addition to the rest of the country, all right? But anyways, to see Afrowave TO, you guys, uh, we did, you know, got you guys on Six Buzz, uh, Breakfast Television mm -hmm. Complex, CP24, everywhere. That's what it's all about. Now, here, here's a question. I'm, uh, you know, I'm going to ask some questions to some of you all that's tuning in and Coburn too. You could dive in. Uh, feel free. Um, you know, by the time we're, you know, we're done in another hour and a half, I want uh, people tuning in to have a, just a better sense as to how publicity, public relations works. And the big question, you know, I'd like to ask is, you know, why do you think some artists get great <laughs> media coverage over others that get very little? Okay, there's the question. Okay, anybody in the chat, Coburn, you could weigh in, Karis, why do some artists get great media attention and they show up everywhere and others not so much? That's the question. Well, I think it's the, I think it's a great question. I think that, you know, coming from a background of working with, you know, different artists and labels and publicists and, you know, throughout the genres, I think that certain artists will sometimes dive in um, to the world of PR and embrace, you know, what it means to be a public figure, what it means to, to work, um, you know, not just on your craft, but doing interviews and giving time. I think that sometimes a lot of artists forget that, you know, these things kind of feed into one another. And that if you're not gonna give, if you're giving all in the studio, but you're not, not willing to interview with your local paper, or your local writers, or, you know, person who just is a blog who is a fan of your music, like, a lot of times these people scale up and, you know, the, the person you, you know, met five years ago who wanted to write, cover you for, you know, a local paper, their own magazine or whatever is, you know, they end up at GQ or, or thing. And so if you make those relationships and you maintain those connections, I think that gets a lot of artists, um, you know, it gets them further than they think, because I think it's easy to kind of miss you know, parts for the whole where you're like, oh, well, this is, you know, not that important to me. I want to do, you know, Spotify. But people who are doing the Spotify charts, people who are on the other apps and, you know, in other places are looking to see, you know, how engaged an artist is and that, you know, completes the story of what an artist is doing. Yeah, totally. So, so that's it. Um, as far as Spotify, so as far as getting, you know, your streams up, right? Wherever your stuff lives, you know, Spotify, you know, iTunes, Apple, um, Tidal, um, there's a direct correlation between, you know, artists will come to me and be like, hey, I'm putting out music. It's not landing on any playlists. OK, um, one part of the one large part of the reason it's not landing on playlists is because it's, you're not generating any media. OK, yeah. So the playlisters are looking to see what types of action you have happening in the media. That's a fact. That's what they tell me. OK, mm -hmm. I have higher level relationships with the titles and the Spotify's of the world. Right. So. There's a direct correlation. You generate, you end up CBCQ, Complex, Fader, Pitchfork, whatever, whatever. Uh, they are looking. They are looking to see where you're getting picked up. And if they see you getting picked up on Pitchfork and Fader, they're going to throw you on some playlists. You understand? So there's a direct correlation. So anyways, to answer the question, and I saw in the chat there, some, you know, uh, I think Byron even said, yeah, the answer is some artists getting great media over others. It's simple. The truly successful, successful ones have a publicist. Okay? Mm -hmm. They have a publicist. So... In the U.S., because um, I'd spent a lot of time working uh, with U.S., uh, you know, I used to, I'm a, I'm a semi-retired journalist, right? So 
I used to write back in the uh, early 2000s for a lot of American uh, magazines, U.S. magazines, the Source magazine, which was for, used to be called the, you know, the Bible of hip hop culture. Um, some of you all might have heard of Vibe magazine. Um, I used to write for them for years, and I worked for a dot com company uh, in uh, based in in Manhattan uh, called you know Urban Box Office Indie Planet. And what I can tell you is that every single successful artist, you know, ones that are actually making money, able to sort of uh, you know you know invest, invest in some real estate, feed their children, feed their families, every single su successful artist has a great publicist. They have a manager and they have a booking agent. Okay, a booking agent so that you're able to generate uh, work. Uh, as far as concerts, um, artists need to know that that's where you're going to generate the lion's share of your money and revenue. It's by doing shows, booking agents. That's what they do. All right. Managers, they also perform a similar function um, as far as generating money, making those kinds of connections, uh, sync rights and what have you. But the publicist, you have to have a publicist uh, to be able to make certain moves in this in the in the music industry. And I'm not I, I say that with no bias. Uh, you can do your own independent uh, research and homework and look at all the stars, you know, Beyonce, Kendrick, and they all got publicists next to them, always. <laughs> their management and publicists, when they're on the red carpet doing the BET Awards, the Soul Train Music Awards, the Grammys, there's always a publicist there. Management and publicist, always, okay? Um, so, okay, so that's just one, okay, so Colburn, did you wanna say something? Cause I wanna dive into a bunch of other things just to give a little, I guess, background on what you're up to. Well, no, no, you can, you can go ahead, yeah, jump in. I think um, one thing that would be like great to establish, because um, I know for me, I didn't understand the difference initially. Um, so maybe Colburn, tell us a little bit about what you do, uh, you know, as a marketing manager. And then if we could just establish for everyone here what, what the difference even is between publicity or like PR and the marketing. I think that kind of would help us before we even get into anything else so that people can, you know, understand the difference. Yeah, I think uh, I think that's the common the common thing that people run into because mm -hmm. I think sometimes when you have really good publicists and good you know PR, it feels like marketing even though it's not. I think that there's a clear delineation between you know when you're paying for you know look, looks or you're you know spending money online um, to get you know a change on marketing and versus when you're getting you know put into publications or you're liaising with TV, TV shows or hosts mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff like that. I think it becomes like a kind of a, a funny line, I think, in today's age because, you know, the magazines aren't really what they used to. There's not a lot of um, the outlets that we're kind of used to, you know, even like with the hip hop outlets, like, like Dalton was talking about, like some of them don't hold the weight that they used to in this digital age because, you know, a lot of them moved online. There's not a lot of them have full-time staff. Um, and then the other thing too is some of them are kind of pay to play, which I think is very confusing for new artists when they're starting out because, you know, people will be like, oh, well, you can, you know, pay me this amount of money and get on this website. And they're like, well, is this PR? And it's like, it's not PR, but it feels like it's PR because that's what the kind of traditional PR kind of looked like, even though it's not, um, even though it's not exactly the same thing. So I think that um, kind of being able to discern the difference and look into, you know, what is this getting me? Where's my, where are my dollars going? Is this going to help me market myself to a new audience? Is this gonna, you know, live on online on Instagram? Am I putting money into advertising or am I spending money um, with a publicist to um, get more brand recognition and, and to kind of, grow a fan base and grow relationships with uh, outlets and press. Mm, yeah, totally. Yeah, no, that, that's great. Great point, Colburn. And here's the thing. I do get that artists are always asking, say, hey, we want to, you know, hire a publicist, uh, yeah. public relations. And uh, they are somehow thinking that they can pay their way, like to get that pitchfork look or pay mm -hmm. to get on the fader or pay to get on billboard or pay. So you can't pay to get covered interviews, coverage, re reviews, previews. Uh, Q and A's, interviews. You 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 can't pay to get on any credible. Um, when I say credible, as the world I occupy is a, uh, uh, you know, just to give example, Billboard. So I've gotten a, many of my clients in Billboard. You can't pay to get an interview in Billboard. Okay, mm -hmm. it's not going to happen. Um, same thing goes Pitchfork. A lot of the top tier credible um, uh, news media, current affairs, even in even in our sphere, you can't pay to get play to get interviews as far as the A-list top tier 
media outlets. You cannot pay to get on there. Um, that goes for other ones too. The fader complex, yeah, you can't pay and say, hey, I want to get in the fader. Here's a thousand dollars. Here's a here's a couple racks. No, you cannot. Right. Uh, for some of the, I say B and C list media, absolutely. There's a lot of pay to pay to play of scenarios and schemes happening. No question. What I would say, so publicists, we work, it's, it's something called earned media, okay? So we work in the world of earned media, meaning um, if I get you into, you know, Pitchfork or Complex or, or anything, it's having to do with the quality of your work and, and obviously us working our magic, us, our ability to sell you, to make you sound sexy and saleable and that you have, you know, you have a nice, interesting story, an interesting backstory. Your art is obviously doing, doing a lot of the talking that I can't do. Um, your, your art has high artistic integrity. Maybe you have some good, maybe you're also active on social media. Your socials are popping. You have a certain look, a certain aesthetic. That's what we work in earned media. Okay. So nobody, we get in billboard pitch for cater. We're not paying a nickel. <laughs> right. Um, so a publicist, what we do, it doesn't have anything to do with advertising or marketing. Okay. So when people, even billboards, you know, you pay for billboards, you pay for full page ads, you pay for banner ads you are paying for those things, right? It's not based on how good you, like, hey, you, I have a great project that's popping. I'm an Afrobeats artist, reggaeton. Um, those, are, those are paid, okay? So advertising, marketing, things you are paying hard dollars for, it's very radically different from publicists that generate something called earned media, all right? Earned, E-A-R-N-E-D, earned media, all right? Okay, um, as, as far as publicity, I'll walk through a couple things and throw it back over to Coburn. Um, I, what I find, Karis, is a lot of uh, artists in Toronto where, mm. I mean, I think, I think when we talk about, I guess, the so-called urban music scene in, in Toronto and Canada in general, it, it feels to me as someone who's worked, uh, you know, with a lot of American media outlets dating back last 20 years, we're about maybe 10 to 15 years behind, all right, mm. when it comes to our, our uh, interpretation, how we engage uh, publicists, public relations, and our general understanding of media. And um, so what I would say is um, to the artists listening in or managers or, or agents, whoever's tuning in is uh, if you get picked up, if you put music out and it gets picked up by a couple cool blogs, right? A couple blogs, uh, you know, reference it, mention it. That's not really a media campaign. Um, and that's mm -hmm. not going to do, that's going to do very little, you know, little to nothing to move the needle as far as, uh, you know, making your career really move. All right. So, so the reason you get involved with publicists or work with people with tied to public relations is, we work with uh, media platforms. It's not about getting on a couple cool blogs and then uh, you know thinking that you've somehow made it. There are basically five main areas we work in. All right. Um, so we work in uh, television. So a lot of uh, you know I'll give you some, just some examples. Some uh, you know seasoned veterans like let's say you know Cardinal Official. He's been my client for I don't know 15 years. So Cardinal, um, the reason he makes a, you know a lot of money and has for many years is uh, yeah when he when we're doing media campaigns and again he's a bit older he's been in the game for he's been you know he's a bit of a I guess a celebrity OG but um, we're not we're our interest is getting doing a lot of television okay and so for a lot of uh, younger artists that are just like I want to get on the cool blogs television we you want to do something called like new audience development right like you you don't want to just be preaching to the choir people that are reading the cool blogs. So you want to hit some mainstream television because why wouldn't you, right? You want everybody streaming your music, not just people who are like me, Torontonians born, you know, Jamaican descent. That's not who I want to singularly stream my music. I want everybody to stream it. So that, if that means going on the social, uh, doing breakfast television, CP24, CBC television, right? You're being, being able to generate, it's new audience development. It's people that perhaps may not look like me. They may not be of Jamaican descent. They may not be Nigerian. They may not even know much anything about hip hop or dance hall or R&D, right? But after you're able to nail some good television, right? You're going to get all these new eyeballs onto your, in looking, at your pro, looking at your music, right? So television is one area, then radio, of course, right? That's another strand. So we're talking, there's obviously a bit of a commercial radio strand and there's public radio, you know, CBC, uh, things like satellite radio, Sirius XM, that type of thing, right? So we're looking at television, we're looking at radio. Then we're looking at, of course, the cool blogs and websites. That's another angle. You want to land your materials on a lot of those. Okay, that's another important third strand. Um, another, a, a, a fourth strand um, would be, which is a really cool one, an interesting one, um, is a podcast. There are a lot of amazing podcasts out there now where rather than you do a two or three minute interview about like, you know, television, it's like a three and a half minute interview. So you can't talk too much about your project. Radio, you get a 10 minute spot podcast now. You can actually talk about the inspiration behind your art, where you're coming from, who you're looking to inspire, et cetera, et cetera, right? So podcasts are also exciting. 
That's a fourth. And then a fifth is uh, newspapers and magazines. Are they there now? There's a downward spiral as far as interest in reading newspapers and magazines. But again, a media campaign for a serious artist, you're involving all five strands. It's not just getting picked up on a couple of cool blogs. It's television, radio, podcasts, newspapers, magazines, and, and podcasts. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what we deal with. All right. <laughs> Independent artists, they get confused by all of that. But that's what a successful when you're nailing all of those things, you're going to see your socials, your numbers are going to go up. Right, you're gonna gain a couple thousand new followers on Instagram, TikTok. You're gonna see your numbers start to go like this, a, a steady ascent because you're hitting off those, you know, ticking off those uh, uh, check, uh, check marks. All right, yeah, okay. So Coburn, over to you. Yeah, so Coburn, how I what I want um, this to kind of pinpoint too, um, since we were still just kind of going off like differentiating, is what does this look like practically for you in terms of the difference with what you're doing in your job. Um, I know like your official title is show man uh, marketing manager. Um, so maybe I guess speaking on how that intersects, you know, with, with marketing, maybe for an artist and marketing music um, in general. But I, what I kind of want to get people to understand too is just the tangible, tangible part of it, the practical part of it. How, how, like what outlets do you push to, you know, in marketing versus like publicity? Um, so if an artist, Words, let's say you were able to work with an artist um what wh what would be the difference in working with you versus working with dalton so on my side um doing show marketing management management i basically take care of shows that play out in within canada from vancouver playing all the way to the other end of the, of the province so basically what would happen is we would work with an artist either to do a tour or um, you know, a small club show or a theater show or a stadium show, and just basically work on the marketing side of it. So when we announce a tour, we're on the live side, we're looking at where the, art, where the artist's audience is, where their fans you know, reside, what are they doing, where their interests are, all that kind of thing. And then we're looking to how best to target them and how best to get people interested and excited about a show coming up. So you know, I think, Often, you know, probably everyone in this chat has had an artist that they like to and they want to go see live or maybe didn't know that the artist was coming to town. And so on my side, my job is to kind of look at that and to how to best engage with people and let them know that this show is coming, their favorite artist is coming back to town. And, you know, this is something that they want to be at. I think, um, you know, how it differentiates from what Dalton's doing is I think Dalton and public publicity is like, you know, getting the artist to the point where they become a familiar face or mm -hmm. they're kind of, you know, engaging with their audience. And at least from there, you know, marketing is taking the audience. And this, this is just this is a lot of times. Just taking the audience, finding the audience, and then also finding like similar audiences. So, you know, I've been to a lot of shows over the course of my life where I didn't know I liked that artist and my friend was going or I, I read about it or heard about it. Um, you know, maybe on Facebook, maybe on Twitter, maybe somewhere. And then I go see the artist. I'm like, wow, this is, you know, a great artist. This is, I'm a huge fan now. So I look at, you know, kind of behind the scenes is, you know, how best to tell people about things. And, and I think that's kind of at the heart of, you know, what marketing is. It's letting people know about something that they might not have known about or they might not have engaged with before. So I think if we take it out of the live side and go to music side, I think that, you know, artists should be looking at, you know, when we're releasing a project, when we're releasing a song or a project or whatever, are we, you know, spending to grow our audience? Um, so the publicity side is, you know, putting in front of press and all the things Delton talked Delton talked about. But I think the marketing side on that is is are we, you know, putting dollars behind to let people know who might not organically have known about this song, about this mixtape, project, album, whatever? How do we find these people? How do we engage with them? And how do we you know, let them know that my new song is really great and, and they should be listening to it. And I think that, you know, when artists are starting out, it becomes easy to be like, okay, let me post it here or, you know, I'll, you know, tag this person on Twitter, or Instagram, and hopefully someone hears it. So I think when you're, when you're doing that, I think there's also extra steps you can take and, you know, letting people know about it, even in your community, whether that is you know, Kitchener and you're, you know, running targeted ads to people who like similar artists or similar genres of music you make. Or you know maybe you're in Vancouver and you want people let people know that you know you're going your first show and you know we're doing it you know at a local bar and we want people to come out and so people who 
might like, you know, an artist that sounds kind of like you or is in your genre? How do we engage those people? Yeah, it kind of sounds yeah. like, um, that, well, this might have been a very long time ago, but like my first year of university, <laughs> we were, it's not that long, but we were learning kind of about, you know, push and, and pull. And that for some reason kind of reminds me of um, those strategies that we learned because marketing kind of sounds more like like you're you're pushing this artist you know at people and then for me publicity kind of sounds more like you're pulling in people that already are interacting with these like um forms of media that may be interested in this person that's being um featured do they like when you are for example cobra and working with um pushing a particular artist, does it, is it that it runs parallel to publicity and does it intersect to you guys like working together? What does that look like, like in the everyday line of work? So I would say they go uh, really hand in hand. And I think that, you know, when you're working on some of the bigger tours with artists who are really well known, they'll have like a, a PR team usually provided by the label or they'll have their own PR team maybe out of LA. And mm -hmm that person's job is to basically you know engage the market see what kind of interviews they can do and before the show let people know this artist is coming down to remind people and then my job is to also look at the people who are you know finding out about these things and reminding them that this is happening and this is something that they want to be at they want to attend and it's going to be you know maybe the best night of their, their lives or you know maybe one of the best shows that they've ever seen so I think that, you know, when PR is done right and when marketing is done right, they really complement each other. They really run parallel and they're, um, you know, here and there for each other. Yeah, totally. And, and, and here's the funny thing is, uh, yeah, the worlds of uh, marketing and publicity are, are uh, inextricably linked. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I can tell you a couple of things, just I'm going to tie into, uh, you know, what Colin was saying. So when you tour, okay, so uh, when you're doing shows across Canada, or even different parts of Ontario, right? So let's say, hey, I'm, I have a little buzz in Toronto, but I want to get better known in uh, Montreal, Saskatoon, Winnipeg, Edmonton, Vancouver, Victoria Island, uh, you know, wherever, anywhere else across Canada or the U.S. for that matter. Um, so, so when you have a publicist, what what ha happens is when you show up in these other destinations outside of Toronto, you know, you're doing a show in Hamilton, you're doing a show in Sudbury, Montreal. When you have a publicist, what we do is we amplify. Uh, your situation there. So my mailing list, so for example, let's say Karis, you were to do a show in Montreal. You're not just going to show up in Montreal like an independent artist and be like, okay, I'm going to do a show and hope that people buy tickets to my show. When you have a publicist, what I'm doing now is I'm connected to a bunch of media outlets in Montreal. So you see, by the time you end up in Montreal, Karis, um, you're being featured in the blog, you know, the cool blogs there, Cult Montreal, mm -hmm. Uh, some of the community radio there. They have some great community radio, CBC Montreal. You're doing a bunch of media. So by the time you show up there and then you wonder why you sold those 362 tickets, it's because you have a publicist that was able to get some excitement happening in that marketplace. So that's something, it's called tour press. So that's what publicists do. When you show up in different parts, let's say you're touring the Caribbean, you have a capable, uh, functioning, credible publicist and you're, you're in Jamaica, but you want to do Grenada, you want to do... Uh, not Guyana, you do Trinidad and Tobago, you want to do St. Kitts and Nevis, right? You want to tour the Caribbean. What your publicist is going to do is when you show up in Trinidad, every single blog site in Trinidad, every single newspaper, magazine, television show is going to know that you're showing up in Trinidad. And by the time you hit there, they're going to be interviews set up for you to do some morning television, morning radio. So you see, by the time you go do your concert and then the things sell off, why do you think, wait, what do you think, what, why, why do you think that happened? Yeah. So that, so when I say again, serious artists, as far as publicity, yeah, you're not just sh doing shows in other cities. You have somebody that's promoting you in Hamilton and knows all of the blogs mm -hmm. in Hamilton, all the newspapers, uh, and getting you looks while you're there and before you end up there. Now, as far as the media, um, here's the thing. This is something that hasn't changed and it hasn't changed in the couple decades that I've been in the industry. And I don't see it changing anytime soon. But the, the media, they pretty much dictate what's hot <laughs> and what's not 100%. So whether you're mm -hmm. into it or not is irrelevant. So if you see something on Six Buzz, that's popping on Six Buzz or GRM Daily, right? UK or R&B Radar. Let's say you do R&B. If R&B Radar is posting your stuff all the time and doing showcases with you, and they have a following of 100,000 people, believe you me, right? So social media, media, and traditional media, that's dictating largely what's hot, 100%. If I get a client to look in Billboard, this is what happens. I'm going to give you an example. When you get a cover story, 
you know, let's when we talk about like, let's say traditional newspapers, tradi like Now Magazine in Toronto, all right, which is now it's fallen by the wayside. They're having some difficulties. But when you get a cover story in Now Magazine in Toronto, uh, Now Magazine is Canada's largest alternative weekly newspaper. But again, they're, they're having some hard times. Uh, you're going you're, you're gonna to probably get about six, between six to eight festival bookings um, just based on that cover story, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so you see, so, so this is the thing. So I get you a cover story, Karis, uh, the biggest, newest, greatest artist coming out of Toronto, independent artist, and festivals are going to come calling you and, they're gonna, and you're going to make money. You know, that, that's how the game is. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So just to tie it into when people wonder, hey, how do I get gigs? How do I get work? Yeah, the, the, my clients they get cover stories. Mm -hmm. They get a lot of work <laughs> because all of the people that book the festivals, they're they're looking at R and B radar. They're looking at Now Magazine. They're looking at pitch where that's what they're doing to see what's hot or not that what they could put in their venues. Okay, so that's how you make that's how you generate revenue. So those those worlds are linked. Also, one more thing I want to talk. There's not an artist that doesn't ask me about getting verified. Mm -hmm. All right, I can't think of one artist. You know, independent <laughs> artists rather, not artists that run through our clients, because I, you know, I work with Universal Music Canada, the major labels, they're our clients. But as far mm -hmm. as independent musicians, they all want to be verified on socials, right? On Instagram, on and everywhere, to be honest, right? TikTok and Twitter. And uh, let me tell you the connection between media and verification. Well, here's the thing. Um, if you're not, um, what I try to explain to artists is how people get verified on social media. Uh, there's a direct correlation to generating media. So when you apply to get verified through, for example, Instagram, uh, or Meta, you know, Meta, Facebook, they own Instagram. Uh, what you have to send them is you have to send them media clippings, right? Where mm -hmm. you have shown up in the media over the last 24 months, right? That's what they're looking at. That's how you get verified. You understand? So Karis, if you're my client and I have you, I got you a Pitchfork, I got you in CBC, right? Mm -hmm. I got you in Complex, I got you Now Magazine, Toronto Star, whatever, whatever it is you're reading, right? R&B Radar, whatever. That's what you submit to Meta, uh, Instagram, to get verified. So artists that get verified is because they're getting picked up in media. Okay, mm -hmm. so a lot of artists, they don't know that. I try to spell it out for them. They're saying they think you can buy verification. They could buy the blue check mark, right? No, you can't buy it. I mean, I think there's some shady underworld, dark, you know, uh, you know, black, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> underworld mm -hmm. market, maybe people are. But I mean, as far as legit verification process, that's, it's tied to the media, that you're in the media and being talked about in the media, then you send that to Meta, you submit it to them, and then presto, there's the blue check mark. You understand? So this is what I'm saying. So the media piece is, is so, it's so important. You can't buy verification. Mm -hmm. it's, it's about how much uh, media interest you are generating. That's how you get verified. You know what I mean? Yeah. And these, um, like working with an artist, because I know you said like, oh, if I'm touring the Caribbean or if I want to tour you know, various areas in Canada. Is it a, what does that deal look like for an artist? Is it, do you have one publicist who's managing all of this or you have a publicist who's managing a certain region, you have somebody else who's managing, like, what does that look like, um, you know, for an artist like getting a publicist and, and playing in different areas or even for marketing, Coburn, if, you know, it applies, is it like a non-exclusive deal? Is it, you know, standards have an exclusive deal? Like how, how does that all work in terms of reaching all those audiences and working with the specific people? Okay, I, I'll answer quickly. The pub, publicity part is um, mm -hmm. you, are, you are dealing with a regional, uh, you know, publicist, right? So, okay. uh, so any sort of credible publicist here, it's like you want to, you know, Canada, as far as Canada. In our yeah. country, is, it, to be honest, not that large, right? It's a uh, populate population's tiny. What is it, yeah. 35, 35 million, right? It's like a the same population in the state of California, then one state, one American state, that's our whole entire country. So our country's not that large. So we do it'd be mm -hmm. national. So, you know, my publicity company, we can cover all of Canada. Now, here's the thing. Um, I'll give you a couple ideas on that. Um, because I mean, I have maybe a bit of a advantage in that because I had worked with Amer US media for many years, even mm -hmm. Billboard magazine, I used to write for Billboard. So I can hit American media, you know, but that's only because my background is in American, you, know, yeah. you see what I'm saying, working with uh, many American media entities, even to this day. So I can mm -hmm. touch, I can touch select, uh, you know, as far as American media, major American media. I would also say too, that the media of today, it's very interesting is uh, a lot of the American media outlets, they have like uh, what we call stringers. And what stringers are, it's kind of like freelancers that represent their interests, despite them being an American media company, right? So, mm -hmm. or, or, or we call them um, branch plant operations, right? So I'll give you an example, you know, you know, Vice, 
you know, like Vice, uh, you know, mm-hmm. Vice magazine, Vice. So Vice, uh, they, well, I don't know if the office is still there, but Vice is a, you know, you know, it's funded by mostly, you know, American, American interests. And, um, but they were able to, although the founders are Canadian, but um, things like complex, uh, you know, right, complex news media, these are American entities, but they, they have branch plants here. Uh, complex mm-hmm. Canada, Vice Canada, yeah. Um, so they, and they have stringers, you know, when you're doing, we do, we do a lot of work in film as well. So you want to get to those big, uh, film magazine variety, um, you know, Hollywood, you know, news reporter, like, yeah, they, they always have some sort of Canadian freelancer or Canadian branch plant. So you're still able to access some of what they do, um, mm-hmm. because of their Canadian correspondence, but, but, but to answer your question, it is largely regional, right? So if I want to do, if Karis, if you're in Toronto, and we want to, you know, get your name out there in Canada. I can handle that. And then I usually partner up with a, a partner publicist that handles the Caribbean and also the mm-hmm. UK, right? And the US, right? So there are people I work with as far as partners that say, hey, we want to make Karis, you're based in Toronto. We want to make sure you bus in America. So I work mm-hmm. with partners in America to make sure that, you know, they leave no stone unturned. They're hitting all 52 states, getting you know, all the major markets, mm-hmm. New York, LA, Chicago, Washington, that type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I would say I'm, 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 using me as an example, you know, we're speaking all these these yeah. great things over, over yeah. my career. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Coburn, just what does it look like for you in terms of, you know, like um, marketing and working with artists and getting them into specific regions? I'd say like, uh, you know, I get the opportunity to work with such a great team and, you know, we're a global company. So mm-hmm. like locally, we have different promoters who would kind of work on shows differently to the region that, you know, they're, they, they live in or they know well or you know, that they're currently in. So I think that kind of makes things easier. It's like you have somebody who's kind of like local on the ground is able to tap into that market and you know, work with people within that market. So when we do you know, national tours, we have people who work you know, in each market and are experts in what they do in that market and just really keeps everything really flowing smoothly. So I think in marketing, you know, especially with artists like you know, doing different countries, different continents, different places, it's nice to have you know, a strong team behind you who can help place you in the market and is familiar with you know, what works in the market. Because what might work in, you know, Ottawa, Ontario might not work in, you know, Mississippi. So it's nice to have people who are there for you, who know the market and can kind of be like, hey, well, maybe this idea would work down here, but it might not work up there. So let's talk. Let's, you know, keep the lines of communication flowing and it makes everything really seamless and really smooth. I know we've just been like talking a lot about, um, you know, like the differences and just like the practical parts of it. But like getting back to a basic question, I know this may be different for you, Coburn, because you're working as part of a, a bigger organization. Um, and Dalton, you may have like more hands-on, more one, one-to-one interactions. What is the process from signing out with someone, you know, coming to an agreement that we are, we're gonna do this marketing with you, or we're gonna do public, publicity with you, sorry, um, to get in results? What, if let's say especially for you Dalton like if an artist is like okay I'm ready to do this I'm ready to get to media I want these features I want to you know start reaching a bigger audience and establish a fan base what what would that process look like for them from that initial conversation to like okay I'm I'm getting there I'm doing this I'm seeing the results Mm -hmm. absolutely good question um what I would say for one this is something that uh, comes up uh, you know often um Mm -hmm you know, to, to hire a publicist or to work with a publicity company, you have to look at, uh, you know, issues around feasibility, you know, as, as it does cost money. Okay. Yep. Um, so that's something, you know, I, I suspect, a, you know, a fair, a large bulk of independent artists here, uh, you know, I, cause I want to get into it, just give you some real, you know, information you can take yeah. away. So, pu- you know, publicity does cost money. Okay. So if we want to, I'm going to use Karis, you're, you're kind of like my, uh, you know, you know, case study, you know, so if I want Karis no. to be known across Canada, <laughs> right. Um, so, so, so here's the thing, publicity does cost money. Now it doesn't cost a lot of money, but it, it might cost a bit more than you might think. Okay. So, um, so what I would say is, you know, you want to budget, this is how publicists, when you come to a publicist, um, t- you know, issues tied to feasibility and budgets, so you want to, what, what most, you know, credible ones are going to tell you is, uh, so, you know, just like a Rome wasn't built overnight. Um, so we, we don't do, we don't do campaigns like a month, you know, like people will say, Hey man, I have a single coming out next month or an album and I want to push it, pump it for a month. Okay. So 
Um, if you come to, uh, you know, uh, an established, um, uh, you know, publicist with that, uh, they're, they're going to decline uh, because, you know, yeah, just like, just like Rome wasn't built overnight. Um, it's the same thing for an artist. You know, we can't make you pop and get, you know, pick up, picked up on playlists and get written up in a, with, in, in a month's time. Um, and this idea around overnight success, that's a bit of a myth. This is a fallacy, right? There is no overnight success. Mm -hmm. Um, acts that you see, uh, you know, doing super well, um, they've been at it for quite some time, but you may not have seen that work, you know, you it publicly, but privately, they've been doing work for probably two, three years. And then people see them showing up everywhere. They're like, oh, where did this uh, rapper, R&B singer, reggaeton artist or Afrobeat artist? No, no, no. They've been working at the craft for years. So you're looking. So what you want to do is you want to budget for put together something like a three month, a three month minimum budget to like to be able to cover three months of publicity, of public relations. And as far as monies, I would say for independent artists, you want to be, you're talking, it's going to run you, you know, easily, I'd say a couple thousand a month, you know, 1500 to $2,000 a month, I would say for over three months. So you want to be able to put aside, uh, Karis, you want to be able to put aside in your budget a good, maybe $6,000 um, to run a very base level three month campaign, right? So what I'm saying is 1500 to $2,000 a month over three months, it's about $6,000. OK, mm -hmm. um, so you want to you want so uh, we always encourage, of course, Canadian musicians to apply for those grants, you know, factor, you know, grants, Canada Council for the Arts, Ontario Arts Council, Toronto Arts Council. We have all these great funding bodies, um, you know, go get that government cheese, you know, to cover your costs, because you can put those fees, you know, those budgets, you know, into your overall budget that you want to hire publicists to put those numbers in there. Right. So so that's one thing is uh, when you work with publicist, um, it's not going to be a, hey, I want to do work for a couple weeks or a month. 99.98% um, of them will decline your query because they're going to tell you what I'm telling you now is that we can't blow you up in a month or a couple weeks. We need about three months minimum. Okay. And it might cost around $6,000, you know, or $5,000, $6,000. Okay. And here's the question before you move on. Does it matter the, um, or what, what would be your recommendations in terms of the type of projects? Because I've seen people who go after publicity or try to hire a publicist for a single. And then there are people, you know, in like my artist community, they're like, if I'm going to spend, you know, this amount of money on PR, then I'm doing it for an album. Like how, you know, does that matter when an artist approaches you? Um, what would be your recommendation for an artist in terms of the type of project they're looking to push? Any any thoughts on, on that? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. People do come, you know, sometimes actually one of actually pretty well-known artists, like, you know, singles campaigns, what have you. But uh, for us, um, and also too, there are, I guess, uh, more up and coming, burgeoning, emerging, uh, you know, publicists that perhaps are, uh, they, they can, you know, spend that time and, and perhaps don't mm -hmm. have, you know, the types of budgets we're working with to to work on, on small campaigns to try to make that happen. But we're looking at the long game. Um, you know, this idea of, be, you know, he, being here today, gone tomorrow, uh, that's that's not, you know, as far as, you know, seasoned publicists, like we want you to be able to live off of your art. You know what I mean? Like, to be honest, um, that that's, or 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 what we've, or we're, uh, it's a, you know, a, a, co a colossal failure. You know, if you're not able to essentially start generating revenue, see some spikes in your socials and get some interest, get some work opportunities, perhaps even pick up a booking agent. Uh, we worked with, we've worked with a number of artists where they were making so much noise. We were able to generate so much media attention for them across, you know, as far as the cool blogs and uh, television, radio podcast that um, all of a sudden booking agents starts to start sniffing around. You know what I mean? And they're just like, whoa, I see you showing up everywhere. And I see your numbers on socials climbing and people are talking about you. you're getting CBC and all that. And then next thing you know, a couple of months down the road, they have a booking agent. All right. So these are the types of alignments we look to do with independent artists. Um, what you're paying for, just even to, and then we'll throw it to Coburn, but what you're paying for essentially $2,000, $3,000 a month, you're paying for our relationships, right? Um, mm -hmm. So some independent artists, they like to, you know, you can go and contact whoever you'd like in the media world. Like you can look up the pitchfork editor, the editor of the fader. So you can do that yourself. Absolutely. You can do it yourself. Um, but what, but the reality of the situation is that a lot of your emails and phone calls and DMs, they're not going to get responded to. Uh, and if they, if at all, like, you know, that that's the facts. Whereas me, uh, we're talking to these people daily. That's part of, that's the bane of my existence. You know, my, most of my waking hours are talking to the, you know, the editors at Pitchfork, at Billboard, at Now Magazine, at Toronto Star, 
that's what I do 40 hours a week. You see, so when I come to them with, hey, say, hey, hey I have this new client named Karis, and I think her stuff is hot, they are going to take it that much more seriously. Why? Because it's coming from me, who they already have a prior and established relationship with, and also a track record, right? Because I'm giving them some real stuff that's making them look good. So mm-hmm. if you hit them up independently, some, hey, I'm Karis, I'm a thing. They're like, okay, your emails and calls may go largely unreturned. If they go do returned, if they do return your calls or emails or whatever, they may not take you as seriously, I would say, in my personal opinion, as if it's coming from me. Why? Because I have a client list, a roster of people who are Grammy Award nominated, a bunch of Juno Award winners, Polaris Prize, you know what I mean? So they're going to take it that much serious, right? And that's kind of one of the little, I guess, dirty little secrets in the public relations world, right? Is I can pitch you and you can pitch you and we'll, and we can do a little test, do a little, do a little study, a little sample, get five artists to contact a media outlet, get me to contact those same five media outlets and look at, and you'll see what, what the difference is in, 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 in reply time, response time and level of seriousness, right? Those five calls are gonna get returned to me within within 24 hours. (laughs) Yours may not get returned at all. And even if yours do get returned, I don't think they're gonna take it as seriously. Whereas me, I have a track record and a history and my company's running 11 years, you know? So they're like, okay, Dalton, obviously, if you're pitching us and telling us about this, it must be something serious, you know? Yeah. And for you, Coburn, um, just to remind you just what the initial question was, just the process, um, like, from the initial conversation to the part where you um, or your team are marketing this particular artist or this music. And um, Dalton did a good job of just kind of bringing up budgets and figures. So if you could just kind of throw in what that looks like, I know it probably will be different just because you work with a bigger like organization um, in that way. But just so that you know everyone here can kind of have an idea of how it looks on, on the marketing side of things. I would say like, you know, it's kind of the best way is like kind of coming up as an artist and getting to the point where you start working with bigger promoters and bigger tours is definitely just building on a D- DIY model. And I think it's it's looking at the people around you um, who are doing music or people around you who might, you know, have an open mic night or, or something at like a local bar. And it's like, hey, can we partner on this? Can I, you know, come in and, and bring some other artists in and maybe we'll make a, 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 a night happen? So I've seen like, you know, people start doing these, they're like little things that, you know, start really small on like a Monday night or, or Wednesday night. And these things kind of grow and, and they kind of snowball to the point where, you know, they're doing sold out shows, you know, coast to coast or doing, they've, you know, gone on like, their, you know, huge tours. So I think starting small and, and kind of building from there, it's like, how do we, you know, start to attract a crowd? How do we start telling our friends about it? How do we tell our friends friends how do we get to the point where you know this becomes a thing it becomes like a night or a monthly um so i think a lot of my favorite you know concerts or artists have started you know their own thing whether it's a monthly or you know kind of a one-off couple shows i think that's the best way to kind of get into the point where you know you kind of grow into the point um we have bigger artists coming and they're interested in, in working with you and and kind of see how uh, everything works and, and what you're doing. So I think what I would say to artists is start small and, and you know, if you can get 10 people in the room and you can like learn how to do st- small stages, like, it, like some people or one of my artist friends actually said to me, like you know, doing a big, a big crowd, doing a 300 person venue is way easier than playing to a room with 10 people. Cause that's, you know, you can see it when in, you can look at everyone in the eye, it's small, you know, if you mess up on words, it's a little, there's some awkwardness there, but once you get over that hump and you can kind of start to see how it works and, and level and, and grow, you know, promoters will take notice, people in the industry take notice of that. And that's, I think the best way for artists to get to the point where, you know, you're being marketed or you're, you know, coming on a support act or you're going on tour as support or you're going on a headlining tour. Um, I'll say just start small and, and don't ever think anything's too small. And don't, I wouldn't say like, you know, don't ever count anything out because everything starts small and it grows to, you know, I'm sure adults and stories. And I remember stories of seeing Drake play on, you know, Richmond and a small club to, uh, you know, 20 or 40 of us at the time. And, you know, last time I saw him was, you know, doing stadiums in, you know, Montreal and in Toronto. And, you know, mm-hmm. so I think just starting small and appreciating, you know, as, as you grow and who you're growing with. Yeah. And having a, even, you know, this idea of a live show, like having a show, right? Because uh, mm-hmm. 
Coburn, like our, like with, uh, you know, Live Nation, you've been there for a little bit. And it's, it's uh, a lot of the, uh, so a lot of, yeah, a lot of, uh, yeah, local artists don't get to touch those larger stages. And it, it, it's kind of, uh, you know, support situations, right? Support acts, obviously. But although there's some weird, uh, there's some weird stories. He, Coburn, do you know A.P. Dillon? Yeah, from Mississauga. He, he did the, he's grown really, really quickly. Well, yeah, he's, I mean, Scotiabank sold out, you know, and he's yeah. an independent. So, I mean, things, yeah, because I, that they're, they're my client, right? Um, AP Dillon. But uh, this idea of doing, you know, being able to, you know, from a PR, I'm going to give you my uh, perspective there is mm. uh, potential clients that come to us. Uh, let's say you don't have a live set or have uh, little to no interest in building a live set. Um, that's a red flag for us, right? Because, um, you're not going to be able to build, you know, that type of engagement or build that type of capacity that we're looking for as far as the long game, right? Because at the end of the day, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm referencing things like tour press, like we want to be able to say, hey, uh, play a couple festivals, Hamilton, Sudbury, wherever, London, Ontario, play, you know, Sunfest, there are festivals everywhere. Uh, so that, that helps, you know, from a publicity standpoint, because we can sort of make you that much larger in some of those secondary markets as well, right? And across Canada, nationally, you know what I mean? So artists yeah. that are kind of like, um, like, it's cool to be the, you know, base, uh, you know, sort of bedroom, closet, uh, basement, uh, SoundCloud rapper or whatever, you know, that, that like, that's cool. But if you have uh, an actual live show, um, yeah, yeah, this stuff is going to start to really start happening for you, you know, just from a publicity standpoint and, and also, you know, in, in revenue generation, right? Because I like to, I, I don't like to speak about publicity as if it exists on a separate island from marketing efforts, mm -hmm. from having a functioning management company or manager, or a booking agent, you know, because uh, when all of those things are working in conjunction, hand in hand, and there's some nice, um, you know, a synchronicity, serendipity happening there, that's all, most of my clients that have figured out those pieces, they're all doing quite well for themselves. They're able to pay their bills, uh, maybe, you know, pay their rent, uh, buy a condo, like every single one. Yeah, when those things are all working, Karis, you know, but if it's like one out of the four, maybe you have a grasp of marketing, but nothing mm -hmm. having to do with publicity, you don't have a booking agent, maybe your management situation is not so great. Like, yeah, the ceiling is a, just a lot uh, lower is what I'd say, yeah. Yeah, I'd say just, like, go ahead. I'd just say some of like, you know, the best artists are, you know, when you kind of get everything going at once and it takes a while to kind of get there, but, you know, having a, a good publicist, you know, looking at what a world out is and, and studying that and being like, this is what I want to do start to finish. Um, mm -hmm. You know, having marketing to support that, you know, getting your friends involved, getting your family involved, like just building a community around your music. And I think that's how I think a lot of the most successful people get there. It's like, do we have someone looking after our digital? Do we have someone looking after our art? Is it all going together? Like the amount of time people put into the studio or writing, I think that effort should be reflected all the way around. And I think that's, you know, helps people build like long, longevity and stable careers. I think it's, it's interesting because I know it's, you know, it's not exactly to the point, but that's basically how Afrowave Teal started. Um, Lex, who started this whole thing, uh, was like, yeah, I'm a dancehall artist and there's just not enough places in Toronto that are giving me that kind of platform and he got you know 10 artists together who are in similar genres and put on a show and then he put on another show and now they're 15 artists and then COVID hit and it's like oh now we're doing virtual workshops now we we have a grant so we can put on a festival so it it definitely does help I really love the advice um Colburn and, and just you Dalton just adding to that um, to start where you are. And, and I think building a community is really, you know, something that's very important to just where your career ends up. Because I see a lot of people who get that initial like flock of, I don't want to say fans, but interest from the general public. And then they completely disappear. Um, I don't remember what I was watching, but there was actually someone, I think it was Chronics. Um, who said you can be alive in real life and die in your career, like <laughs> completely die in the media. And I thought that was, that just kind of reminded me of that point because I think community and just a general like solid fan base has a lot to do with, you know, your longevity just in the industry. It's um, huge. It's, you know, we even care just to, even to, here's, here's the thing. So, and, and you know, just to add on to your piece, like yeah. chronic chronics is a part of a community of artists. Okay, oh, yeah. you understand, right? Protege, yeah. like he's he's a part of yeah. a community. It's not like he just busts himself. 
Yeah. You guys, Afrowave TO, I mean, I'll mention because uh, Sean Paul, like this is the thing, you guys have a community and it's organic and you mm -hmm. support one another. And a number of artists, Afrowave TO artists, because you presented Sean Paul, they got to open up for Sean Paul. You see what I mean? So yeah. that's, so these are the types of things, you know, we talk about community efforts, you know, and getting those types of looks, playing history, which is a great venue, you know, it's, what is it like mm -hmm. 3,000 cap, 2,500, 3,000. And uh, so, yeah, but, but, it, but so a lot of artists that do come out there, there is a sense of, they have a, a community, a cult following. There's this African proverb, uh, you know, it takes a, it takes a, a, vi a village to raise a child. Yeah. You know I mean? It takes a village to, to bust an artist too. You know what I mean? It's the same thing, yeah. same concept, you know, like the African yeah. proverb. Yeah. And most artists that you'll see, they do come from a, you know, Sean Leon, you know what I mean? He comes from a camp, you know, Daniel C. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Though? Right. Jazz Cartier. Yeah. It's like, you know, get home safe. Like everybody that they come from a, 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 a cluster or a crew or, yeah. or posse or something. You know what I mean? Although I don't know if people know that or not, but that's facts. 100% facts. Yeah. So I know that we are at seven um, and I do see some questions. Don't worry. I see them. I see them. We're definitely going to get to them. Um, I just had just two more things that I wanted to ask before we even get into Q and A. Um, so you guys kind of talked a lot about working, you know, getting different people to kind of work together and, and build this synchronized effort around, you know, like, pushing as an artist with marketing, with publicity, with touring, with booking, like all of that different stuff. Um, what are some of the red flags? Be, you know, feel free to throw in some green flags as well in terms of artists looking to take people onto their team. What, what is like a no-no, you know, with working with someone in marketing, a no-no for working with a, a publicist, um, as well as some good signs for someone to bring onto your team? Well, I would say start with, you know, be realistic about your goals. I like mm -hmm. to always tell artists to start to work like maybe six months out um, to start and then you can get to start planning years out at a time. But I'd say yeah. be, be realistic about your goals, be realistic about what you're looking for. And, you know, it's good to dream big, but, you know, make actionable goals for yourself, make things that you can kind of set out and you can see that, hey, I am increasing, you know, whether it's taking your monthly listeners from, you know, 50 to a hundred or, you know, more than that. It's kind of getting to that point where how do we take little chunks and make it actionable? So I think that's um, one of the things I would say. And then I think the other thing for me would be basically to look at, um, you know, are people over promising, you know, is this person telling you they're gonna get you a platinum single in a week? Like. So some of those things where it's like, don't look into people who are over promising or trying to sell you too much and kind of look at people's histories, look at what they've done before, look at their resumes, their CVs, as you will, in this industry. Because I think with music, there's sometimes uh, not always as much of a barrier to entry as some other careers where it's like, oh, well, look at this person, they've done this, this, this. So I would say be realistic about what people are promising you, look at you know, their kind of resumes and where they come from. And then, you know, see if they can fit in and mesh and, then, and make sure that it feels good. Because I think there's something to be said about having a good vibe with somebody. Mm -hmm. yeah, totally, yeah. Awesome. yeah, for sure. I mean, um, I, I like this idea around, um, yeah, managing expectations. Um, that, mm -hmm. That's a biggie. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll sort of echo a little bit of what Coburn was saying there. This idea around... Um, our artists do come to us and they expect, uh, again, this sort of overnight success that they're going to get picked up in Pitchfork after having worked with us for all of three weeks, <laughs> at, at which point um, we're, you know, we're just like, no. So managing expectations is a real, you're not going to get it in Billboard that quickly. You know, we can help. We're here to expedite, help expedite that process. But uh, uh, your trajectory, your journey, um, it has to be uh, rooted in some kind of reality too, you know? And, mm -hmm. um, and even that goes even too, as you're, out there even looking to engage a publicist or public relations company um you know don't don't hire someone who makes big promises either you know so i i would you know having you know worked with many musicians in you know different capacities like i i if i were a musician coming out of toronto or canada or anywhere for that matter like i'd steer clear of anyone who makes promises to you um including publicists right like the only promise mm -hmm. a, a credible publicist can make is that they're going to work really hard on your behalf. You know, if they made the decision to sign you on as a client, they obviously believe in you. Again, these are credible publicists, right? You can get a lot of people to take your money. Um, uh, so if a publicist says that they can get you, guarantee you coverage in, in any one specific uh, newspaper, magazine, blog site, uh, podcast, like guarantee you, if they're promising you coverage, 
at some big well-known outlet, I would run steer clear far away from that. I wouldn't go anywhere near that because yeah. there's no publicist that can guarantee you coverage. Even if you're like the super A-list uh, artist who has a track record and you're getting like a ton of streams, I can't guarantee you that I'm going to get you in billboard. No. What I can do is I can take that ammunition and given my track record and I'm able to work some magic, I've been doing this a long time. Uh, the probability is, is, you know, is quite high, but am I going to guarantee anyone that we're going to get you big, big uh, uh, looks, you know? So that's why I say there also to with artists, I'd say to when you're engaging, when you're talking about marketing or engaging, you know, booking agents, publicists, like um, stay in your lane. What is that for? Stay in your lane forward, stay in your lane. Sometimes musicians, they're getting, a. Uh, I find uh, they, maybe they're reading, you know, they're doing a lot of, like, there's a lot of information that's available to you about um, public relations and, and the world of media and social media, but yeah. um, let the experts uh, do, do their job, you know, um, you, there's, there's no, because when artists come to me and say, hey, what about this? And I'm just like, look, man, come on, this is what I do. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, there's my company running 11 years yeah. and this is what I do 24 seven. No different than if there's some marketing scenario, I'm staying in my lane because I don't, I dabble, I understand marketing because I'm a bit older. So I've kind of been around the block a couple of times, but, uh, but I, I, you know, let the experts do what they do, you know, sit back and let them work their magic. That's what I'd say. Right. Mm -hmm. So don't, uh, yeah. My final question, just before we get into um, Q and A uh, would just be, I know we talked about, you know, building community and all of that and starting small, but are there, is there like a specific or a driving factor that you think is important for artists to keep in mind when they're trying to push themselves, trying to promote themselves, trying to market themselves? We have a lot of people on here, including myself, that we, we have to do our own social media right now. We have to be the ones walking out and be like, you know, here's my stuff, this is what I do. Um, is there something that you think we should hold as as important or like core to all our marketing efforts and all our promotional efforts i think you you got to be your own biggest fan because at the end of the day you're going to be the driving force behind it so you know whether it's you know how you walk into a room and i think for a lot of times you know when i was starting out and coming up it's it's about how you present yourself it's about you know making sure that you're also networking like, like horizontally, people who are coming up at the same time with you and, and making sure that, because these people are going to rise with you and like, you know, like the old proverb too, like a rising tide lifts all boats. So you can all, kind of all come up together. So I think that when you're looking to kind of promote or get a start, a head start on yourself, it's, you know, make sure that, you know, what you're doing feels right and you feel strongly about the direction you're taking, taking time to assess yourself and, um, you know, think about, you know, where you want to be, you know, kind of like what I was talking about before, with the six month plan, start to plan things out ahead, start to look at, you know, what your goals are and where you want to be. And then there's a lot that you can do yourself. And, you know, it's, it's not always the easiest. It's hard, but there's, you know, if YouTube University out there, there's countless articles, countless books, a lot of people who've done it themselves before kind of always passing back knowledge. And I think, you know, coming to things like this is always good. It's always something that I did a lot. It was listening to people speak who've done it before, been there before, people who, you know, because it's easier to learn from other people's mistakes than it is to, you know, make new ones and learn from those. So if you can, you know, know kind of where to steer yourself and what not to do, it helps you kind of get to where you want to be, even though you're going to make your own mistakes and it's going to it's gonna be a challenge. And it, I don't think anything else you know, nothing in life comes free, nothing is easy. So if you're, you know, up for the challenge and you want to kind of drive yourself and, you know, work with people around you as much as you can and figure out, you know, where you, where, what things are that you want to do and accomplish, I think that's, you know, a good way to kind of set yourself on the right path and, and move forward. Yeah. Yeah. And even in, you know, this idea, like you also don't want to be reinventing the wheel. You know, um, there, there's there's so many resources, including human resources. Um, I'm a, I'm a strong proponent for mentorship. You know, um, a lot of the tricks of the trade, uh, you know, I learned it's from people that were you know 10, 15, 20 years older than me. I got to be honest. A lot of the tricks of the trade around, especially around revenue generation. You know, so if you're gonna go out there and say, hey, I want to buy my first condo, um, you know, and I, you know, go go talk to some people that own a couple condos. You know, they're gonna walk you through that within, you know, you know, a couple of a two hour session at Starbucks at the neighborhood sex Starbucks, you see what I mean? And it's going to, so you're able to expedite that process. So I'm very big on mentorship and, uh, 
just surrounding yourself, uh, just just connecting, I guess, uh, you know, multi generationally, right? Because you know, mm -hmm. one function of of youth, uh, I would say, you know, because I have even you know a sixteen year old son, I have kids, and one function of youth is to think you have everything figured out, um, you know, to think you, I, I know it all, I've figured out, but 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 you but you really don't, you you know what I mean? Then you hit thirty two, then you're just like, damn, I, I don't have, you know, so. So I, yeah, so I'm big on that. Just like how I'm here, I'm, I'm pretty much spelling out. I'm saying, listen, if you don't have a couple thousand dollars that you can spend minimum uh, per month over a three month period, uh, you know, trying to seek out a publicist, is, that's not, it's, it's not, a, it's not going to work for you. You know, you just, you know, do some independent fundraising, write grants. Uh, so you see what I mean? So it's, it's that these types of things. So there's less guesswork and I can just tell you, you have to have this amount of money minimum to even begin to even think about launching campaigns. Because when I throw those figures out there, that's those are minimum fees. Like if you can't, those are minimum, right? Like I, I bill a lot more than that for certain clients. You see what I mean? A lot more. That's just minimum. Mm -hmm. Saying you can't play the game like the way it needs to get played if you don't have five, six thousand dollars minimum to get a, your publicity efforts happening, right? Minimum. All right. So surround, get some, you know, role modeling, mentorship. Find somebody in your sector. Maybe perhaps you're in music management. You want to be a booking agent, an artist, a producer. Um, a songwriter, find somebody who's been there, has a track record and, uh, you know, uh, model what they do, mirror what they do, invite them out for a cafe at Starbucks. No, I do not work for Starbucks. I don't know why I keep mentioning Starbucks, but invite them out for lunch or something, right? Yeah, because they're just going to give you, I'm, I'm happy to give free information. You know what I mean? I'm not here to hold on to some people gatekeep. I guess what they call like so-called gatekeepers that are like older. Um, they, you know, in, in, in this community, I find they don't want to give opportunities to, 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 to our youth. You know, they want to hold on to their jobs and whatever, but no, no, I'm, I'm the, I take the opposite approach and I love giving free information. Well, you ask me, what does it cost to get that producer to get, you know, get some, I'll, I'm going to tell you, <laughs> I'll just tell you straight. So uh, always don't be free to ask questions. People that have been around the block there, sometimes they're waiting for, you know, young, aggressive, curious, inquisitive young musicians to ask them those tough questions, which would be happy to answer, you know? Yeah. Awesome. So I want to get into these questions that I see here. Um, oh, this one's directly at you, Dalton. So Byron's just asking if you're taking on new clients. Um, Byron, I think you could probably reach out to, to Dalton after and have a chat. Take him to Starbucks. And have a have a chat with him. That's right. Take me to this this nice um take me some some uh, this, this nice spot. They have a uh, jollof rice, you know, in the in the East End. You know, what I mean? no, no, I'm joking. But no, no. But here's the thing too is uh here's the other reality too, right? Is a lot of okay. So again, for publicists, PR professionals that have been doing this for a while, um, we 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 send out a, or our team we send out a lot of declines. We decline a lot of material because uh again, you know music with high artistic integrity we have to see something we have to it has to be saleable something we can sell so what i'm saying is um it doesn't even need to necessarily be something that i super enjoy right so let's say Kara sends me an ep you know six five five tracks and i think it's a seven out of ten like personally you know it's, it's not exactly my cup of tea but i can sell it why because Karis is perhaps doing something with a, a hardcore Jamaican vibe. And I know that uh, journalists are into that right now because of protege and chronic. You see what I mean? I could sell it. We're going to take on Karis as a client, despite the fact that I may think her music is a, perhaps, you know, maybe like a seven out of 10. It's not the greatest music in the world, but, um, but I could sell it because of some of the messaging, the songwriting, the production. It's just on that wave. You see what I mean? And I could sell it. We will take those people on as clients. So it's not even so much about, in fact, some of the most successful projects we manage, it's not my personal cup of tea. Like I've greatly enjoyed their music or I think that they're making timeless music, but it's something that I could sure as hell sell, right? Some people, they even have a certain look and aesthetic about them. Like they're super, well, you know, beauty is subjective. We're all beautiful. There's, you know what I mean? So that's subjective. Beauty is the eye beholder, but they just have this thing happening. You know what I mean? They're just attractive to potential music. You're right. The way they dress, the way they flow, they have a fashion thing happening on there. You see what I mean? So so that's what I would say to that. Um, a lot of the things that come in my inbox are declines. Uh, we, we don't, we, yeah, it's a lot of declines, the vast majority, to be honest, to be perfectly blunt. Um, but so when you're coming to a publicist as well, um, you know, you got to bring the goods, you know what I mean? The music or, or come with, you know, say, hey, on social media, like we have a little cult following. We've done a couple of shows. We've, you know, we can sell 80 tickets, like something. You got to be coming with a lot of just ammunition. 
right? Because if I, you know, if I, yeah. So, you know, yeah, you have to be something that I can sell, I would say, you know, like, yeah, that's what you have to be thinking when you're approaching any publicist, you know, is it something mm -hmm. they can sell? And we have another here. Whose job would it be? Um, PR or marketing to monitor and control interviews or social media? Um, an example they're given here is bad, bad publicity or branding. So I guess um, that would be just in terms of the artist's image and reputation when something goes south online. Um, so I just want to know if that would be PR or if that oh, yeah. would be marketing. Yeah, that's, that, that's PR. We, yeah, yeah, we have, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, we've had situate, like, I just worked on a film. Okay, and then Coburn, I'll throw it over to you. Just, so TIFF, the Toronto Inter International Film Festival, Mm -hmm. um, so there, there's a film called Black Ice, and it's a film about, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, sort of like anti-black racism, you know, racism in hockey, diversity in hockey, you know, because hockey is not the most, it's a very homogenous sport. It's largely, mostly sort of white, white men, you know, um, so women don't get the respect they, in the sport and, and racialized community. So anyways, the, the film, yeah, it's called Black Ice, and so that's what publicists do as well, is there, we're, we're here to out fires. Um, there's a lot of damage control involved. So anyways, the film Black Ice, it uh, world premiered at TIFF uh, a couple weeks ago. And um, it's a film that's executive produced by Drake and LeBron James. And um, it did very well. Uh, the film actually won the People's Choice Award for uh, Best Documentary uh, at the at TIFF a couple weeks ago. Anyways, in the lead up to the film, a couple days before uh, it, it made its world premiere, um uh it got a lawsuit like you know somebody <laughs> basically this a uh, lawyer who's attached to the nba that he used to be attached to the nba players association he um players union he 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 said that that this uh, uh you know basically the crux of the film it's like uh he owns the rights to it you know what i mean like it's something like that so he so it was a lawsuit so that came so imagine you're about to launch an album or something and then they, somebody says hey the music and the and the lyrics on there you stole them from me and then they, there's a lawsuit you know when your album is about to come out in two days so that's what happened with the film, <laughs> the big lawsuit. Um, now, anyway, so that's part of our job too, is when things start to go south on social media, like let's say you're getting crapped on on Six Buzz or so, you know, some site. Um, so we are, we do a lot of that too. We do that in the shadows. So that, that's actually a great question because sometimes you wonder how artists are able to dig themselves out of a mess. The smart ones that actually have budgets are able to get that government cheese factor funding or are able to independently finance. There's usually a publicist uh, working in the shadows to help get them dig them out of that thing so we will write a uh, response a release like you know what i mean that's what we do <laughs> that's part of what we do damage control that's part of a one part of our portfolio yeah colburn so i'd say like you know with pr and, and uh, that's kind of another thing where they kind of blend in, in a lot of people's heads but i'd say that's more kind of on the artist team and then sometimes it can kind of get wrapped into into pr or publicity but it's more on the artist team if there's like kind of a bad look or in that kind of realm, um, definitely it gets into publicity when it's like bad publicity or bad press that's in that kind of realm. There's, you know, a whole industry that I'm sure Dalton knows a lot about that, that deals with that side a bit more, but um, definitely not on the marketing side. Marketing side's very much, you know, not in that kind of wheelhouse, but definitely on the on the artist team to kind of control the artist image and then publicity, what goes out into the media. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we'll even contact if things start going south yeah. Rather than the artist uh, doing a sort of peer to peer thing, like we'll literally holler at the, you know, see what I'm saying though, right? As yeah. far as yeah. on socials and be like, yo, what's going on? Like, what's good? You know what I mean? Like, like what's, what's really good? And then, you know, try to work, talk, you know, but behind the scenes in the shadows to sort of repair that relationship. So we do that. We do that all the time. Awesome. Um, I don't see any other questions here. Um, but I can say if you do have any other questions, um, send them our way. I'm just going to put the, the email in the chat here for anyone who may have any other questions. Um, you can send them to operations. When you send to operations, you're talking to me directly. And I'll try to see if we can connect you to either Coburn or Dalton if it's you know something that I think they may be able to help you out with and get back. And Dalton just dropped his IG. Um, you can hit us up at Afrowave TO on Instagram as well. But I do want to take this time, seeing that we are approaching the 7.30 mark, just thank everyone. Thank you to the panelists who took time out of their schedules. As you can see, they're two very busy men in this industry. Um, we always, always appreciate when um, people who have such an active role are able to come on 
spare an hour and a half and drop all these gems for us, you know, Dalton, you touched on, you know, how hard it is sometimes to get this information. Um, so I really appreciate both of you being on. I want to thank all the attendees. My famous line is these workshops would not be the same without you. And it is very true. Um, all three of us could sit here and talk to each other about it, but it's it's so much better when we see your engagement and your questions and just get to you know learn from you as well. So thank you everyone for coming on. The next workshop that we have will be about navigating dancehall, reggae, and Afrobeats in the Canadian music industry. We have some great artists um, within those genres that will be coming on and speaking to us just about their experience in the industry and how they've been able to navigate up to this point. So you do want to go in our Instagram link or on our Eventbrite page and just um, sign up for that workshop next week, Thursday. But thank you again, everyone. And I am wishing you the best night, best weekend. Thank you for being here with us. Have a good night, thank everyone. You. Thank you.